Okay, we're going to cover chapter two now, which is the chemical level of organization. It's a basic review of chemistry and organic molecules that hopefully you remember from biology. So what is chemistry? Chemistry is the study of the composition and properties of substances or matter, which remember matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. Why do we study chemistry? Well, we study chemistry because we are chemical beings. Our cells, which are living, are composed of non-living chemicals. We also rely on these chemical reactions that are occurring in our body to help maintain that happy, steady state that our body likes to maintain called homeostasis. So the metabolism, which remember is the sum of all of the chemical reactions in our body, maintains, helps us maintain homeostasis, which is that internal balance within our body. So all living and non-living things are composed of matter, which again, anything that takes up space and has mass. There are three different forms, solids, liquids, and gases. Solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. Liquids have a definite volume, but they take on the shape of whatever container they're in. And gas has neither a definite shape nor a definite volume as they dissipate when they start to go into the air. So elements are the building blocks of matter. They're the smallest thing that can be broken down naturally. There's 92 naturally occurring elements and 118 different elements. The rest of the ones are made in a laboratory. Each one has a unique chemical symbol, which is a letter abbreviation. It can be one or two letters, and there are 26 found in the body. Table 2.1 in your book actually goes over all of those elements that are found in our body. The major ones found in our bodies are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. 96% of them are these four elements. 3.6% are lesser elements like calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, magnesium, and iron. And just because they're lesser elements does not mean they're not important in our body. Calcium, for example, besides bones, is also very important in heart contractions. Phosphorus, very important in DNA. Potassium and sodium are very important for action potentials, which we'll talk about at the end of the semester. So even though they're tr lesser elements, they're still very important in our body. And then there's about 0.4% of trace elements. And this is just a little chart showing you guys, 96% ma are made of those four elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and then the lesser and trace elements. So an atom is the smallest unit of matter. The different elements are made of these atoms. All atoms of the same element will have a similar atomic structure. And we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons have a positive charge and an atomic mass unit, so their weight basically of one. They are located in the nucleus. Neutrons have no charge, they are neutral. Again, weigh about one and are in the nucleus. Electrons have a negative charge. Their weight is negligible, so we count it as zero, and they orbit around the nucleus. So if you remember, protons positive, they both start with a P, neutrons neutral, both start with nu, and then electrons are negative. So the electron shell are where these electrons are found in their orbit. They fill the inner shell first and go out to the outer shell. The first shell is full with two electrons. The second and third shells are full with eight electrons. The outermost shell is called the valence shell. So the electrons are called the valence electrons. It follows the octet rule, which is just eight makes them stable. There are more shells and more electrons, but for our purposes, we don't really care about those. If you're going to be a chemist, then you care about those. So for us, two in the first shell, eight in the second and third shell. So even though that third shell technically holds 18, we care about those eight. If the outermost shell is full, that is considered to be stable. And again, the nucleus or protons and neutrons are found.
So this is just showing you the first, second, and third shells. The first shell being full with two electrons, and then eight electrons for the second and third. The outermost shell is the most energy, the most energized shell. And then the carbon symbol over there is just showing you the abbreviation, the letter, is the atomic symbol of the element, which this happens to be carbon. The number six above it is the atomic number, and the atomic number is actually equal to the number of protons, so the number of positively charged elements, or not elements, positively charged positively charged subparticles, sorry. The atomic mass is the weight of the protons and neutrons, so you put the protons and neutrons together to get the atomic mass. So, if you look at carbon, for example, and you have the atomic number is six, you can actually calculate how many neutrons it has by taking the atomic mass, which is that 12, and subtracting the number of protons, which is six, so you know there's six neutrons in this particular element. This is showing you electron shell models versus electron cloud models. Protons and neutrons again in the nucleus, and then the electrons orbit the nucleus. With the electron cloud model, you can see all the blue around the nucleus is basically the cloud where electrons are going to be found at any given time. The electron shell model is usually what books use because it kind of makes more sense for you guys. If you look at the first shell, you can see the two electrons there. If you look at the second shell, you can see there's four electrons there, and this happens to be carbon again, so six total electrons. And you can look at that model and see very clearly, as opposed to the electron cloud model where you're kind of not knowing exactly where the electrons are. So reality is more towards the electron cloud model. But for our purposes and the book's purposes, the electron shell model gives a better visual. If you look at the other picture, that's just showing you again, there's six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus, and then you can see these six electrons orbiting the nucleus. So again, to determine the number of subatomic particles, the atomic number is the number of protons, the atomic mass minus the atomic number is the number of neutrons, and in the periodic table, all of those elements are neutral, so the number of electrons is going to equal the number of protons. So if you go back to carbon, <clears throat> the atomic number was six, the mass number was 12, so 12 minus six is six, so that means there's six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons in that particular element. Atoms are neutral in charge, again, so those elements, all of those are neutral. So your number of electrons is going to equal your number of protons. However, if you have an ion that is a charged atom, so the number of electrons does not equal the number of protons. So ions we'll talk about in a little bit, but ions have a charge. <coughs> Isotopes are atoms with different numbers of neutrons, so they do not change their charge, because remember neutrons are neutral but they do change the atomic mass. They change that weight, and that can make a big difference. For example, carbon-12 and carbon-14, same number of protons, they both have six. However, carbon-12 has six neutrons, carbon-14 has eight neutrons. That addition of those two neutrons actually causes it to be radioactive and very unstable. However, we can use carbon-14 for a variety of things. We can use it for cancer treatment in high doses. In low doses, we can use it as a tracer for medical imaging. We can use it for carbon dating, fossils, and rocks. So it does have a lot of uses. If you look at here, we have nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. Hydrogen at the bottom there shows you it's got one proton, one electron, and no neutrons. Nitrogen has seven of each. Oxygen has eight of each. So the outer shell of that atom likes to be full. So they look to fill it. 
How? Well, they can give up or donate an electron to another atom. They can accept electrons from another atom. Or they can share electrons from another atom. And when they do this, when they look to fill that outer shell, now we have chemical reactions taking place. So chemical bonds are actually formed during this. So only the electrons in the outer shell participate in these chemical reactions. Any electrons in the inner shells are not going to participate. So that's why that valence shell is so important. When the shell, outer shell is full, the element is considered to be inert and non-reactive. And these are the noble gases. If you look in the periodic table of the elements, the column all the way to the right, if you're looking at it, all the way to the right, those are the noble gases. You have helium, neon, krypton, xenon, radon, and argon. So those will not react with anything else. Okay, molecules versus compounds. Molecules are two or more atoms chemically combining. So for example, if two nitrogens combine, you have N2, that's a molecule. They're the same atom. Compounds are two or more different elements combining. So C6H12O6, which is glucose, that's a compound. Free radicals have unpaired electrons in their outer shell and they are extremely reactive and can really cause damage to your body. Superoxides are an example, and that is why they everybody says take these antioxidants and drink grape juice, and that's actually why wine, if you drink wine every day, you know, like one glass I'm talking about, but if you drink a glass of wine every day, the antioxidants can actually help clean your body of these free radicals. So, question becomes, Oxygen, what is that? O2, what is that? H2O, what would that be qualified as? And O2 negative, what would that be qualified as? So oxygen is an element. O2 is a molecule because you have two atoms chemically combining that are the same. H2O is both a compound and a molecule because this is the exception. All of the books constantly refer to water molecules. So even though it is technically a compound, it's considered a molecule as well. And O2 negative is actually that superoxide we were talking about. So not all molecules are compounds but all compounds are molecules. So sometimes the terms can be used interchangeably, which is the case with water. <clears throat> so chemical bonding, the first type is an ionic bond. This involves a complete transfer of electrons. So one element gives up and transfers over one of their electrons to another element. This is often associated with inorganic molecules. And a good example is sodium chloride, NaCl. The sodium has one electron in its outer shell. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. So sodium gives that extra electron to chlorine. In doing so, sodium is giving up a negative charge. And if you give up, a negative charge, you become more positive, right? So sodium becomes a positively charged ion, Na+. Chlorine, on the other hand, accepts that negative electron, so it becomes more negatively charged. So it becomes the chloride ion, Cl negative. Cations are positive, anions are negative. The only way I really have to remember that is somebody told me a long time ago, cats are positive. So I remember cations are positive ever since. If it works for you, great. If not, no biggie. 
Electrolytes are often formed when an ionic compound breaks apart into cations and anions in solution. So when these compounds break up, you often are left with these cations and anions. So the sodium ion, chloride ion, that's the bicarbonate ion, and the potassium ion. This is just showing you sodium donating that electron to chlorine, becoming NaCl. Now the thing is, even though you cannot see what's happening really, it changes the entire composition of these elements. Sodium in its natural form is a metal. Chlorine in its natural form is a noxious gas. But when you combine them and transfer with one electron, you get table salt. So it kind of shows you how much it changes them. The second type of bonding is covalent bonds. This is formed when they share electrons. You can have a single, double, or triple bond based on how many pairs of electrons are shared. This is associated with organic molecules. We have two types of covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar. Nonpolar bonds, the electrons are shared equally between the atoms, like methane, for example, CH4. The carbon and the hydrogens all share those electrons equally. Polar, however, are shared unequally. One of the elements will have a stronger pull over those electrons than the other one. Water is a perfect example. Oxygen is a lot larger than the hydrogens, so oxygen has a stronger pull on those shared electrons than the hydrogens do, which makes oxygen more electronegative. When you have polar molecules, it creates this electronegativity because of the stronger pull that one element has over the others. So it's said that hydrogen are electropositive and oxygen is more electronegative. So in the structural formula, a single bond is represented by one line, double bond, two lines, triple bond, three lines. So here are your examples. Hydrogen, H2, is one single bond. Oxygen, O2, if you look in the middle there, you can actually see two pairs of electrons are being shared. So that's a double bond. Nitrogen, three pairs of electrons are being shared, so that's a triple bond. Here's methane, CH4, and water. <clears throat> so methane is nonpolar. The hydrogens are sharing those electrons equally with the carbon. Water, however, oxygen is so large, it's so much bigger than those hydrogens that it has a larger pull over those electrons than the hydrogens do. So again, it makes the oxygen more electronegative and those hydrogen more electropositive. And that's what those symbols stand for, the delta plus and the delta minus. The last type of bonds are hydrogen bonds. These are very weak attractions that are found between molecules. They're weak, but yet strong enough to hold DNA together. So that's a good thing. DNA has to be unwound often, though, for replication, transcription, and translation. So oftentimes DNA will be unwound. So those hydrogen bonds kind of have to be weak so that it can be unwound. They have to be strong enough to hold it together, but weak enough so that we can unzip it. Water is on the other side, so they're represented by dotted lines showing that they're kind of weaker. So water molecules have hydrogen bonds holding them together. So the thing about water that you need to remember is between water molecules, you have hydrogen bonds. But within a water molecule, you have polar covalent bonds. <clears throat> so hydrogen bonds between water molecules polar covalent bonds within a water molecule. So, chemical reactions are constantly being happening in our bodies and they involve making and breaking bonds between atoms. So the reactants are what go in, the products are what come out. And oftentimes enzymes are required. 
enzymes often have an ASE ending. So you have your reactants yielding your products. The arrow shows you the direction that the reaction is going. Enzymes, the whole point of enzymes, are that they lower the activation energy. The activation energy is the energy that's needed to initiate that chemical reaction. So if you need a lot of energy to initiate a chemical reaction, an enzyme can come in and lower that amount of energy needed. So imagine if you're trying to push a rock up a huge hill. An enzyme would come in and lower that hill. So they're continuously, these chemical reactions are continuously happening in our bodies. Even when you're just sitting there right now listening to this lecture, chemical reactions are happening in your body. And this is referred to as metabolism. This is just showing you the activation energy needed to start a reaction and how an enzyme will help that, a catalyst. It's going to lower that energy activation. We have two major types of chemical reactions, synthesis and decomposition. So building things up, our synthesis, breaking things down, our decomposition. So for example, glucose and a glucose yields a maltose. So you're making, creating maltose. And on the other hand, breaking down maltose into two glucose is a decomposition. Anabolic reactions build things up, so same thing. Catabolic break things down, so they equate to decomposition reactions. Synthesis reactions are also endergonic, meaning that they need energy. So to create something, you have to put energy in. Decomposition are exergonic. They give off energy. So they breaking things down gives off and releases energy. Oftentimes, these two reactions are coupled with each other. So the decomposition reaction will actually fuel the synthesis reaction. So the question becomes, is this synthesis or decomposition? You have glucose plus oxygen yields water, carbon dioxide, and ATP. It's decomposition, by the way. <laughs> so when chemical bonds are broken, energy is released. When you're forming new chemical bonds, energy is required. Again, the energy released during the decomposition reactions can be used to drive the synthesis reaction, and it's called coupling. Metabolic reactions involve energy conversion so the cell can do work. So the whole point is that the cells need energy in order to do the work they have to do. Energy is the capacity to do work, and it takes different forms. We have potential energy, which is stored energy. So the chemical energy stored in the bonds, the food that we eat. And we have kinetic energy, which is energy of motion. So mechanical and transport types of work. So if you think about um, potential energy is water behind a dam, and then you open up the dam, and that changes to kinetic energy. Or if you think about a log that has stored energy, if you light it on fire, it transfers to kinetic energy. So make sure you read about exchange and reversible reactions and redox reactions. Reversible reactions just can go either way. And redox reactions, when one of the chemicals is reduced and one is oxidized, so gaining or getting rid of electrons, basically. If something is reduced, it gains electrons. If something is oxidized, it gets, gives up electrons. So I know that might sound strange, but if you think about it, remember electrons have a negative charge. So if something is reduced, it's gaining a negative charge. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it like that. If something is oxidized, it gives up that negative charge. Remember, heat is always given off in any kind of reaction. It's not 100% efficient, so you lose that extra energy as heat. <clears throat> Inorganic versus organic. Inorganic are associated with non-living things. They are smaller and usually have ionic bonding, except for water, of course. Their chemical composition 
they do not have carbons attached to a hydrogen. Organic, on the other hand, are associated with living things. They're larger, they have covalent bonds, and they have that carbon attached to those hydrogens. They have that carbon backbone. So the question becomes, which of these are inorganic or organic? So what is water? What is glucose? Carbon dioxide? Sodium chloride? And methane. So did you get those? It's important to remember though, inorganic and organic are vital to living cells, so we need them both. Water is vital for life for a variety of reasons. It's about 55 to 60 percent of our cells and body fluids, but water has certain properties that are crucial. Water dissolves solutes, so it is known as the universal solvent. Water actually dissolves more substances than anything else on earth. A solvent plus a solute equals a solution. <clears throat> so solvent being water, solutes being what we have in our bodies, glucose, sodium chloride, waste, gases, sorry about that typo there. And it allows for transport of solutes in the body. So very important. Hydrophobic things do not like water. If you remember, phobias are fears, hydrophobic, fear of water, and hydrophilic things love water. So you have water fearing versus water loving. So water fearing things like oil. If you've ever put oil into water when you're boiling spaghetti or something, the oil kind of just sits on the top. There you go. It also participates in chemical reactions. Dehydration reactions are synthesis reactions where you take out water and you form a bond. And if you think about it, if you're dehydrated, what are you missing? You're missing water. So you take out water in a dehydration reaction, form a bond instead. Hydrolysis reactions are the opposite. They're decomposition. Water is put in to break the bond. And if you think about that, hydro is water, lysis means to break. So you're using water to break a bond. So you put water in and now you have your monomers. Water also has a high heat capacity and high heat of vaporization. This is important because that means that temperature changes do not happen fast in water. It takes a long time for water to change its temperature. It also takes a long time for water to evaporate. If you've ever started boiling a pot of water and walked away and then came back a half an hour later freaking out, but there was still water in there and you were surprised, that shows you that high heat of vaporization. It takes a long time for water to fully evaporate. High heat capacity allows for that moderation of temperature. If you've ever walked into a lake and you walk in and it's pretty warm, but then you keep going and all of a sudden, bam, you hit that cold front. That's because water doesn't change temperature very fast. So the deeper you go, the colder it's going to get. But this is very good because it allows animals to stay alive and survive. Temperatures do not change very quickly. Water doesn't evaporate. This is a good thing. It also serves as a lubricant so that reactions and things can happen a lot easier. <clears throat> Acids, bases, salts, pH, and buffers. In general, inorganic compounds are classified as either an acid, a base, or a salt. Acids release hydrogen ions in water, like hydrochloric acid. Bases release hydroxide ions in water, like potassium hydroxide. And salts release ions in water. So it's not hydrogens or hydroxides, it's another ion, like potassium chloride. 
our body has to maintain this acid-base balance, which is measured as pH. pH is actually the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution, and the scale goes from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral, below 7 is acidic, above 7 is basic. The more acidic something is, so the lower the pH, the more hydro hydrogen ions that are contained. The more basic something is, so the higher the pH, the more hydroxide ions they contain. And the hydrogen and hydroxide ions have an inverse relationship. So the more hydrogen there is, the less hydroxide. The more hydroxide, the less hydrogen. So if you have a pH of 1 that is extremely high in hydrogen ion concentration and extremely low in hydroxide ion concentration. So gastric juice, for example, has a pH of 2. If you have a pH of 12, let's say, that is extremely high in hydroxide ion concentration and low in hydrogen ion concentration. Oops, sorry. So here you have acidic as a solution with a pH below 7, more hydrogen, less hydroxide. Basic is above 7, more hydroxide, less hydrogen. And neutral is a pH of 7. So if you have pure water or distilled water, that would be neutral. And this just shows you the pH scale. It's logarithmic. So a pH of 1 is 10 times stronger than a pH of 2 and 100 times stronger than a pH of 3. So as the pH increases, the concentration of hydrogen decreases. So they're inversely proportional to one another. Change, a change in one pH unit to another yields an increase by a power of 10, as I said. So a pH of 1 is 10 times higher than a pH of 2. A pH of 1 is 100 times higher than a pH of 3. So table 2.4 has a pH of some substances, so the question becomes, acid, basic, or neutral? What's blood? Urine? Gastric juice? And bile? So blood is 7.35 to 7.45, so that's slightly basic. Gastric juice is 2, so that is acidic. Urine is unique because it can be acidic or it can be basic depending on what you eat. If you are a meat eater, your urine has a tendency to be more acidic than if you're not. And bile is what the liver produces to emulsify or break up fats. So that is basic. Buffers are what help resist changes in pH. So buffers help maintain homeostasis. We're going to talk, you're going to talk about buffers in AMP2 in more detail. So for now, just know something like the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system contains weak acids and weak bases. So what they can do, what it can do, a buffer system is if something starts to get too basic, it will actually release hydrogen ions to make it more acidic. If something starts to get too acidic, it will actually release hydroxide ions and take up extra hydrogen ions so that it can become more basic and be back to where it was. Organic compounds are the four categories, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Again, this should be a review from biology. So in general, dehydration or synthesis reactions make large organic molecules from smaller ones. So you combine monomers to make a polymer. It's anabolic, it's building up. Hydrolysis or decomposition are the opposite. You're breaking down large organic molecules into smaller ones. So a polymer adding water is going to be broken down into its monomer components. And again, that's catabolic. 
So here are the building blocks of the macromolecules that we really care about. Monosaccharides are simple sugars. They combine and form polysaccharides and complex carbohydrates. Fatty acids and glycerol usually form lipids like triglycerides, fats, oils, steroids, phospholipids. Amino acids combine and form proteins, which we have a wide variety of proteins. And nucleotides combine and form nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. Oops, sorry. So, carbohydrates usually have a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1, carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. Monosaccharides, glucose, is used for our energy source, C6H12O6. It is a hexose because it has six carbons. Deoxyribose is the sugar of DNA. It is a pentose because it has five carbons. And ribose, which is the sugar of RNA, is also a pentose. Disaccharides are two monosaccharides combined. Sucrose is glucose plus fructose and sucrose is what we commonly refer to as table sugar. Lactose is glucose plus galactose, and that is milk sugar. And maltose is two glucoses combined. So you have these simple monosaccharides combining to form disaccharides. Polysaccharides are strings of monosaccharides combining. If you string glucoses together, you can get a few different polymers, polysaccharides. Glycogen is one of them. Glycogen is how we store energy in our living beings, how animals store energy. It's temporarily stored in the liver and skeletal muscle. And then what can happen is if we need glucose, we can take out these glycogen energy stores and break them down into glucose. Starch is a plant polysaccharide. It's easily digestible and used for energy for the plants. So anytime plants have excess glucose, they will store it as starch. Cellulose is a plant polysaccharide that isn't digestible for us and is used in fiber, used for fiber in their diet. Cellulose is actually what makes up the cell walls of plants. So all glucose polysaccharides but completely different functions and completely different digestibility even. So here's some pentoses and hexoses, so deoxyribose and ribose, and then glucose, fructose, and galactose. Disaccharides right here. And showing you how polysaccharides for glucose molecules can be formed. Lipids are hydrophobic. They are insoluble in water, but soluble in alcohol. Fatty acids are the building blocks of triglycerides and phospholipids. Triglycerides are fats and oils. They have three fatty acid chains and a glycerol molecule. They store twice as much energy in their bonds as carbohydrates and proteins do. So this is for long-term energy storage and insulation. Adipose tissue in our body actually stores triglycerides after we take in so much of carbs, proteins, and fats. So adipose tissue, we're going to review in chapter 4, adipose tissue is one of the types of tissue that actually stores and insulates. So adipose tissue is um, our fat tissue in a nutshell. There are two types of these fats, saturated and unsaturated. Saturated fats are associated with animal fat. They're solid at room temperature. They're harder for the body to process. And they do not have any double bonds between the carbons and their fatty acid chains. Unsaturated fats are associated with plants. They're in liquid form at room temperature. They're much better for our diet. And they do have double bonds in the fatty acid chains. Phospholipids make up the plasma membrane of our cells. They're what are called amphiphatic. Amphiphatic is an interesting thing. 
They have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. So water-loving head, water-fearing tail. So in the plasma membrane, it is set up as a double bilayer and you have the hydrophilic heads on the outsides and those hydrophobic tails tucked into the inside. Soap, hand soap, bars of hand soap are amphiphatic. And if you think about that for a second, it's a good thing that it's amphiphatic because if it was completely hydrophilic, it would completely dissolve in water when you washed your hands one time. If it was completely hydrophobic, it wouldn't suds up and wash your hands. So hand soap has to be amphiphatic because you don't want it to be used in one use. You want it to last, but you also want it to do the job. Steroids are another lipid. They are made of four fused carbon rings. Cholesterol is an example. Cholesterol is a part of the plasma membrane as well. Cholesterol is responsible for stabilizing the plasma membrane. Some hormones are, car are steroids, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, and some short distance hormones called eicosanoids, which you'll learn about next semester, are also steroids. Fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K can actually deposit in tissues and become toxic to your body. Basic functions, vitamin A, site, vitamin D is calcium absorption, E is a skin and antioxidant, and K is blood clotting. So you wanna make sure that you have these in good supply, but don't overdo it. Because if you do overdo it, it can actually poison your body. The next macromolecule is proteins. They are highly diverse. They have many functions, structural, regulatory, movement, defense, transport, catalysts. Structurally speaking, we have things like collagen and keratin. Anytime you hear collagen, you should think of strength because collagen adds strength. Keratin usually is a lot of waterproofing. Hormones are the long distance messengers from the endocrine system that regulate functions. Actin and myosin function in muscle movement. Antibodies are immunity and defense. Hemoglobin transports oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then enzymes, of course, are catalysts that speed up chemical reactions. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Two amino acids can get together and form a dipeptide, or multiple can form polypeptides, and large ones can form proteins. 20 different amino acids make up all of the proteins. And if you think about it, it doesn't sound like a lot of amino acids, but then when you think about just switching two in a chain makes a whole different protein, kind of makes sense. They're named by the R group. So you can see in this picture, this is the basic amino acid structure. So you have an amino end and a carboxyl end, and then a carbon in the middle, and then your hydrogen up top and your R group at the bottom. That R group can be anything from as simple to a hydrogen, all the way to chains of things that can get pretty ugly, actually. The peptide is the bond that's formed between amino acids during dehydration synthesis. And we actually have four different levels of structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. As you can see in the picture, primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. So whatever amino acids you have, write out the sequence, that's the primary structure. So valine, glycine, isoleucine, glutamine, that would be primary structure. Secondary structure is when the hydrogens of those amino acids interact and they form either alpha helices or beta pleated sheets. The tertiary structure occurs when the R groups interact and they form the 3D structure of the protein. And then if multiple polypeptides get together, that forms a quaternary structure. Hemoglobin is probably the best example. There are two alpha and two beta chains in hemoglobin. So proteins have to maintain that three-dimensional shape to be functional. 
We have two general types, fibrous and globular. Fibrous are insoluble in water. They're structural in function. So collagen, elastin, keratin, and so on. Globular are more soluble in water and they're more metabolic in function. So enzymes, antibodies, hormones, etc. If a protein becomes denatured, it loses that 3D structure and is no longer functional. It can be permanent or it can be reversed. It depends on how long it's been denatured and how bad the denaturation is. <clears throat> Factors that can do this, temperature, pH, ion concentration. If the temperature gets too high, proteins will denature. If the pH is not whatever is set for that particular protein, it will denature. And same with ion concentration. So enzymes are very important. They speed up chemical reactions. Your basic enzyme reaction is the enzyme plus the substrate yields the enzyme substrate complex and that's how it breaks down whatever it's breaking down. So sucrase, for example, is the enzyme for sucrose. So sucrose will bind to sucrase, forming the enzyme substrate complex, and then the enzyme will catalyze the reaction of breaking sucrose down into glucose and fructose. Maltase is for maltose breaks it down into two glucose molecules. So it's specific, the enzyme is specific to the substrate. The active site is where it fits and you can have induced fit. So what happens is the substrate binds to the active site and then the active site kind of closes around it and cuddles it so that nothing else can fit in or bind. Again, usually they end in ASE so sucrase, lactase, maltase, they're very efficient at what they do. They can be used over and over and over again. You don't run out of enzymes usually. They can be used until whatever is gone. So for example, if you drink milk, you drink lactose. Lactase will be released. It will break down all the lactose and then when all the lactose is gone, the lactase will finally disappear. So you only need small quantities of enzymes. They are subject to control, so feedback inhibition does happen. So once all of the lactose is gone, for example, it will shut off and you won't have any more lactase. Oops, sorry. Nucleic acids, the basic structure is nucleotides. So you have a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. Cytosine is a C, adenine is the A, guanine is the G, thymine is the T. Those are the nitrogenous bases you find in DNA. And then cytosine, adenine, guanine, and U for uracil are the bases you find in RNA. Adenine and guanine are purines. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pyrimidines. I always remember a pyramid can cut you because a pyrimidine, cytosine, uracil, thymine, cut. If it works, it works. If not, don't use it. <laughs> DNA compared to RNA, the sugar is deoxyribose versus ribose. The base is, again, DNA has thymine, uracil, RNA has zero cell, one phosphate group each. The sugar phosphate backbone occurs in both, but DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded. DNA stores genetic information, RNA carries out protein synthesis. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, it's a nucleotide, not a nucleic acid. It carries just enough energy for the cell to do this work. So movement, transport, chemical reactions especially. So it's an adenosine, ribose, and three phosphate groups. That last phosphate group though is very unstable. It can readily detach and reattach. So if it's attached, you have adenosine triphosphate. If it detaches, you have adenosine diphosphate plus that phosphate 
and it gives off a lot of energy. It's reversible so it can go either way, but when it gives off energy, when it's broken down, but to create it again requires energy. So we have this ATP, ADP cycle that goes on in our body, constantly breaking it to create energy and then creating it again. So ATP ACE is the enzyme that breaks down ATP. ATP synthase is the enzyme that creates ATP. So ATP being broken down into ADP plus the phosphate gives off energy. ADP plus the phosphate requires energy to create ATP. So ATP being broken down is exergonic. ATP being created is endergonic. So quickly review, ATP is generated by cell respiration. You have the anaerobic phase, which doesn't require oxygen. However, you only get two ATP molecules from the glucose molecule during glycolysis. Aerobic respiration requires oxygen, but remember you get up to 34 ATP molecules from that one glucose molecule during the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So the aerobic phase is where the money's at, so to speak. Okay, that is it. So if you have any questions, make sure you send me a message.